I've always been interested in writing, reading letters to papers, little short stories, things like that. And that's how there's a book in everybody. Everybody can write a book if they put their mind to it. So I decided one day I would when I retired. You keep putting it off and then one day I thought, right, January the 1st, I'm starting. So how many hours a day I'm going to write a book? What do you write about? Something you know, which is me. I know me, I've got my memories of my childhood, so let's think about that. In a sort of a light-hearted, sort of tongue-in-cheek way. And then I, before that, I'd always read uh, Bill Bryson's book called the life and times of the Thunderbolt Kid, which is very similar, but writing in probably the 60s in Australia, uh, and, and again, he, he, his childhood was a little bit, he's not as old as me, so things were a bit more modern, and I thought, well, I can go back farther than that, and I remember in the 40s, so I thought that might be quite interesting to a few people, so I decided to try and write it. Uh, so I started it on the January, spent a few hours each day. The more I wrote, the more memories came flooding back. So in the end, uh, it took me about, no more than about six, seven months. And uh, so I finished up doing it. I had help in getting it to book four. Uh, and I decided I'd got to self-publish it because being a nobody, nobody wants to uh, give it a start. So that's what I did. What's your favourite memories of Clay Anger? Oh, I think I think the favourite memories would be uh, the, the fields, uh, the surrounds of Clay Anger. The, 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 there was fields, there was there was swamps, marshes. Uh, even a refuse tip was it, it was manner to a kid, you know. In those days, we could when we were close to uh, woods, trees, forest, climbing. All these type of things, we got canals, uh, we got pools to skate on in the winter, swimming in the summer. We, we had an, it, it was ideal today, it's all built round, it's, it's not the claim that it was, which nothing ever is. And we've got a beautiful park as well, and different days were spent doing different things, but there was always something. And what I did like as well was the characters. Oh, there were some characters down Clanger, there was, you know, they're, they're named in the book. Uh, some of the funny stories, and you couldn't make these things up, you know. You you just gotta you gotta meet these people and the way they spoke. And even now, uh, when we meet old people off the village, some people I've never seen since I was a kid. This book has brought a lot of people together, and uh, and we still remember those characters, you know. And uh, once they've gone, they've gone. So who's your favourite character? M Magic. Everybody knew Magic. Everybody knows about Magic and his stories. And that was handed down. <laughs> my dad, my granddad, my, all my aunties and uncles, they all used to tell me. So as a kid, Magic was about, well, he looked old to us, but I suppose he'd be in his 40s, 50s. And uh, some of the stories they, they tell. Not not only him, but another character near to us, only two doors away, was Frankie Meacham, was used to dress up. And, and Frank was a character, anything for a laugh. And uh, we, we had some fun as kids. Uh, playing around with Frank, I remember one day, uh, it was 19, I think it was about 1945, just after the war, and he got a big microphone, you could hear him all over the village, and all of a sudden he let me have a go, and it, I remember shouting through it, has the baby been fed yet? And it was my mother feeding my brother who had just been born, and Frank is broadcasting it all over the village, what's going on in our house? And, as I say, these characters was, was brilliant at that time, but I loved it. Was your mum very strict? Oh, yes. Very strict. Uh, you didn't argue with her. She got a backhander. Never done me any harm, I suppose. Just not my confidence about a lot when I got older. It was no problem when I was young, but as I got older, obviously you want to throw the traces over, and, uh, and that's what I did. But she, yeah, she was pretty strict. Not. She was a bit like my granddad, her and my granddad used to always have a, having a barn with each other at one time. I remember one time she said something to my granddad, uh, he wouldn't go and have his eyes tested and his eyes was bad. And he said, uh, my mother said something to him like, uh, 
you, um, if you don't get the do doctors, you'll go blind. Well, he thought she said, if you don't get to the doctors, you ought to go blind. And of course, he chased her up the road, throwing things at her, and she, they never spoke for about a couple of weeks. You know, that's how fiery they both was. But, uh, and if there was any arguments, my dad used to just grab all of me and clear off somewhere till she calmed down. That was how uh, she did it. Tell me the story about the telegraph pole. Oh, that was true. Yeah, that was funny. Um, I was sitting in the house one day and through the front window we saw a gang of workmen pull up and get shovels out of the lorry and start digging a hole right in front of our right in front of the house. So my mother's out. What's going on here then? Sticking this pole here, Mrs. J P. You're not. You know, having a pole in front of my house. Well, we, we, you've got it, this is where it's got to go, it's got to be equal distance between, that's where it's got to go. She said, I ain't putting that pole there. If you put that pole there, that's, I'll burn the bloody thing down, I'll tell you. And Frankie made him say, if she says she'll burn it down, she will do it. She said, I wouldn't put it there. And anyway, next thing she's off down to the shop with a, with a can, and she's going to buy some paraffin to burn it down. And she would have done it. <laughs> they had a little meeting and decided to move it from the next door's garden. So now it's still there, to, it's not metal today, it's uh, not wood today, it's a metal one. Uh, and it's discreetly placed between the two houses next door, but it's nowhere near where my mother's was, so she won that battle. Tell me about your first day at school. All right, the first day at school, oh well, I tried to escape in the way out of my comfort zone. It was a, a, a I go for a few hours now to um, to get used to the. Well, we never we never did that. You just went in straight in. Coming from the comfort of your own little front room with your parents there, and I just went in, and it was such a depressing walk down past the church door on your left, and this little narrow passageway, and then into a little gloomy little cloak room, and uh, and then you went in this big high ceiling room with brown and yellow uh, emulsion walls and it did just look drab and I didn't like it so the first, as soon as the teacher took her eyes off me I was gone. But I was soon back. Mother soon caught on me, scruff of the neck and I was back. Not very, uh, wasn't very long. Um, what's your favourite memory of Clayanga? Well, what what do you mean the the area of it or yeah. or, or just your general the living there? Oh, general living there. I'll, it was it was a strange village because I spoke to people since about uh, I've done my book and, and we all come up with the the fact that nobody seemed to have any side on them that that everybody was together. They all sort of there was three streets. The one street, which was the church street where the church was, there was a lot of terrace houses. And I got a lot, seemed to have a lot of kids. That was sort of the lower end of the mother. That probably wasn't, but that's how we saw it as kids. The Bridge Street, where the th through traffic came, that was the posh street, and we were the middle street. And that's how I was seeing it. But everybody got up, the kids didn't play together. High Street kids played with High Street kids, Church Street, and Bridge Street. That's what we always do. But as time's gone on and we've all left, everybody speaks to claim that we were all one big family. And there was no uh, Lord of the Manor, there was no, everybody got on well and, uh, well, they had the arguments like everybody else, but uh, it, it was a lovely place to be and we was all, it was sort of, I don't know whether it's that man mentality, is it? Where, where the flood victims are, we, 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 we're survivors, we, we was cut off in 47, uh, we couldn't get, no milk or anything was delivered, so we just had to walk up to Falsall Road, the, the council cut us a little track. And, and we was like that for weeks, and uh, but, but we all got on with it. Everybody helped each other, and they'd all got a guard in a piece and swap vegetables and, and things like that. So it was a proper community, a little village community, and it was a little bit unique because a lot of villages you've got the church and the village green. It we weren't like that. It was different from there. It was cut off, and yet we were all together. It was, and we we loved it as kids. So I couldn't wish for a better place to grow up. And I think every everybody I've spoke to since they'll say the same if I grew up there. 
And um, what do you miss most about it? I miss, I miss going down there. When I walk down there now, I miss how it used to be. I'm going down a housing estate now, from the only from the one end, mind you. Uh, but it's changed. It's well, there's a bus service which we never had for a start of, and there's cars going down. Which it's, I suppose it's the same how every village changed. It isn't the village anymore. It's part of part of a town. Uh, where there's a lot of villages, although they get new houses on, the centre of the village stays the same and we're playing around. It, it's more crowded now with more cars. Where we had a nice couple of fields opposite, that's been houses now since the 60s. So, and where it used to be the farm is now a house. So that's changed. The little, uh, more the surrounding area, which I used to love with the fields, that's all changed now. I mean, there isn't a rubbish tip now. <laughs> Good, but bad for kids, you know. Mm. I remember once <clears throat> when I li when I went back to live down there. I got I know got a little backyard, and we got a hedge, and there's a tree growing in this hedge. And I went outside, and I looked, and there was a kid about eight or nine. He was climbing up the tree, the bottom of my garden. I said, "What you doing up there?" He said, uh, "I was climbing a tree." I said, well, "Climb a tree somewhere else." Uh, I said, you know, I need to come on my, I said, go and climb up, um, and, and I'm thinking, and not, I couldn't tell him where to go to climb a tree, because all the ones where I used to go, they'd all chop down, they'd all gone. So, in the end, I said, go on then, carry on climbing, I said, uh, and then when you finish, clear off. But that, that was how I suddenly realised how things had changed, that, even in that, that was, I'm going back to the 70s, and that had changed by then, so, obviously, it's changed more so since, so. Sad, but that's it, that's life. Things change, don't they? Yeah, and of course you had that torture tree, didn't you? In oh, that was at the school, yeah, that's still there. Still a picture in the book. Um, obviously not you, you wouldn't be allowed today, would you? But, but I found out since as well that uh, they got me and they banged the back of my head with the knuckles. But somebody reminded me not long back that they also used to be pieces of coke that used to be to stock the school boiler and they used to get handfuls of coke off the pile and they used to use that on the back of your head as well and rub it. Well, you, you imagine coke out, it used to pull your hair when I had hair and uh, they reckon they used to hurt a bit more but I was lucky I used to have the knuckles so that might have been a coke shortage that day, I don't know. So uh, yeah, and that's still used, well still there today but obviously uh, not used. What was your first day at work like? Work? I mm -hmm. can't remember my first day. Uh, oh, I do, it was in the summer. I started work on the, um, the it was the August holidays, and the, the, the pit was off. Well, we, I could have waited till six weeks, had my six weeks holiday off school and started, but I said, no, I'll start, I want to do some money. So I started on the Monday. and. Uh, I couldn't go down the pit, you've got to be trained before we went down the pit. So I went to the, down the, the wood yard and our first job was emptying the trucks into piles at the side of the rail. So two of us got in a, a truck and there was lengths of wood, about four foot planks, chucking them out, that is for prop, uh, padding on the, on the roof. And that's all we did, you'd keep unloading, then there was the logs, the trees that we call them, we chucked them out. And then we'd stack them into neat piles ready for when they was, or we'd load them onto the little dams that took them to the pit head. And the sun was shining, and we stopped and we had a drink of water and a sandwich, and then we went to the canteen. And I thought, oh, this, this beats school any day, you know, so, uh, which it did. And then after the war, of course, we had to go train in, and we went to Hensley, and we had a week at college and a week down the pit for 13 weeks, I think it was. And uh, and then he was back down. What what I did find was strange when I went down. I expected noise and grumbling, and, and it was deathly quiet, because all the noise of that is far up into the workings, you see. So obviously, uh, it was dead quiet in the pit bottom. That, that was a stra I found, found that strange. It was unexpected. I you know, imagine it was all noisy, but it's not, it's not quiet. 
Uh, but, but apart from that, you know, it was pretty much as I expected. What did he that do? My dad? Yeah. Well, he was a pint. He worked on the council for years, a Brown Hills Urban District Council, when it ran itself. Uh, and he didn't anything there. Uh, he was painter and decorator, that was in his spare time. Uh, he could do a bit of carpentry, he made all our own toys for Christmas, uh, glazing, brilliant to see him cut a piece of glass that thick, psh, break it. He was brilliant, sign writing, he'd do that. Um, bit of bricklaying, he was a fit great thing. Uh, he could do anything like that, but his main job was at the uh, at the council, Browners Council, and after a few years, he got a, somebody persuaded him to start his own company of doing uh, painting and decorating, <coughs> and he went in partnership with a bit of a rogue, uh, to say the least. So, my dad was a wood, he wasn't a businessman, he was a worker, and he got took to the cleaners, so he dissolved that partnership and went in with another chap. Now, he wasn't a rogue, but he was a... He was, I don't, wouldn't say he was an alcoholic, but he did like to drink rather than work, so my dad found that he was doing all the work again. So unfortunately, uh, instead of going on his own, he, uh, <coughs> he went with somebody he shouldn't have done, and uh, he worried him, I think it worried him into waltzes. I think that was the start of his decline in his health, and he, uh, he finished up going back on the council. So, uh, and that's where he finished. Uh, Till he retired, he retired on the council. Ron, that's fantastic. Thank you very right. much.